Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti al Parlamento europeo, è con grande piacere che vi porgo a nome di tutti i deputati, mio personale, il benvenuto nella nostra aula, anche se in una modalità diversa, nuova, inedita. Voglio ringraziare il programma Euroscuola per il suo impegno, per incoraggiare voi giovani a parlare di Europa, ad esprimere la vostra opinione sulla democrazia europea, sui diritti fondamentali, sui nostri valori comuni e su tutte le tematiche che vi stanno a cuore. Stiamo vivendo una situazione straordinaria, inaspettata, che ci ha condotto in questi mesi a prendere delle decisioni senza precedenti, ad adeguare i nostri strumenti, a definire delle nuove politiche che corrano di pari passo con le esigenze e le necessità di tutti i cittadini europei. La democrazia non può essere sospesa, soprattutto nel mezzo di una crisi drammatica come questa, il vostro incontro oggi nella prova palese. È un grande piacere vedere tanti ragazzi, tanti giovani come voi che si interessano all'Europa, che dedicano il loro tempo, le loro energie, il loro cuore a sostegno di un'Europa più forte, unita, solidale. Oggi con gli strumenti e i fondi messi a disposizione dall'Unione abbiamo la possibilità di progettare quella nuova Europa, un'Europa che sia più equa, più verde, più digitale, proiettata verso il futuro. Ed è essenziale che voi siate gli attori chiave, perché tante sfide attento, attendono proprio voi, le nuove generazioni. Ed è nostro dovere sentire il peso sulle spalle fin da subito di queste vostre necessità. Today, 80 schools and about 2,400 students uh, from 24 different countries all over Europe are actively participating. And we would like to know from which country you are joining us today. Please answer in English on the platform slido.com. All the European Union is there. We are already said that we have 24 member countries. We see um, Latvia, Ireland, Finland, Croatia. We have Greece and Belgium. And uh, it's very nice that you all participate 447 participants at the moment we would like to ask you um, how can we ensure the development of less developed countries in Europe without generating a pollutant industry thank you so um, I think the EU is um, is really um, putting in place many important initiatives on, for instance, circular economy, uh, which uh, means that uh, we should, at the end of the day, not produce waste, but everything that um, uh, flows into the production process should be then reused, recycled, and that the, we would minimize uh, the, the waste. And equally important is the initiatives to eradicate the toxic substances from, from the production. So um, I think uh, we all, um, whether, whether the countries are uh, wealthy or less wealthy, we can now adopt these new uh, procedures. And there are many ways the European Union is directing funds to, to, to promote this kind of circular economy, which, uh, which uh, radically transform industrial policies. Uh, when it succeeds. And it also brings about um, savings because then uh, we wouldn't be wasting raw materials anymore. And above all, we would not pollute. So I would say that um, whether it's agriculture, whether it is industrial policy, uh, whether it is, um, uh, is managing um, uh, local waste uh, systems, uh, the circular economy is a key concept. And I'm very glad to see this because I've heard this for the first time in the 90s. So it, it sometimes takes too long that uh, very important and necessary ideas uh, get into the practice. But um, this is the moment when many, many of these ideas around sustainability that have been promoted for 20, 30 years uh, are now becoming reality in the EU. And we have, to, we have to really work hard on those to make them happen in, all over the EU. 
It's uh, from Jagoda. She wants to know what is your opinion about the situation of women and abortion in Poland? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this has really been discussed a lot in, in the parliament in the past months. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, two resolutions dealing uh, with this. Uh, for instance, um, the parliament adopted a resolution uh, just a few weeks ago uh, um, when uh, this uh, very, very strict anti-abortion law in Poland became one year old. So, And then there were Polish uh, women uh, in the European Parliament uh, to discuss with us and demonstrate with us uh, against the Polish law. And we see very much that this is connected with uh, the repressive policies, which also have led in Poland to a serious deterioration of the rule of law and, and democratic institutions, including the independence of the judiciary. So this is really an important issue. A large majority now uh, in the European Parliament is voting for Uh, resolutions which um, ask uh, Poland to to, um, uh, to bring back the right of women uh, to decide on their bodies and, and improve it. One of the keys of tackling climate change is long-term products, products which can last a long time. Do you think companies can make this a viable model without prices which would make it unattainable for, for the middle class people? Well, durability of products is a big environmental question and um, um, probably some of you know that the European Commission has already made uh, proposals in order to, uh, for instance, to uh, oblige uh, producers of um, um, washing machines uh, and other electric appliances that they must be repairable. And in order for them to be repairable, um, the product must be um, uh, the kind that it can be deconstructed. Because as you know, if, if the washing machine in your bathroom or kitchen, if it uh, if there's a problem, then very often what you, you, you'll be told by the professionals that, oh, it's so difficult, it's, it costs so much to repair, buy a new one. So we have to do away with this. So indeed, uh, there are many different ways in which we can uh, we can uh, add to the lifetime uh, of products. Uh, and and in this connection, I'm sure that you all are somehow involved in campaigns to, to you know to not to do too much uh, shopping. Uh, today is uh, the Black Friday, and some companies are already saying no to this campaign because they feel that while it's of course uh, could be a good occasion to to buy something that you really need, but more of the, more most of all it it, um, it feeds uh, consumption of uh, things that we do not need and um, I feel I'm, I'm much better off when I when I repair my clothes I have something on which I repair permanently it's my favorite uh, cardigan but it's it's already quite old so we have to bring this to the production of uh, of um, uh, of uh, different companies and um, there was something about middle class um, um, I didn't quite get that Point, but I understand that um, it might have to do with the question that is it only a, is it only for the middle class and better off. Unfortunately, uh, the products that are not repairable, that are not durable, are still cheaper, and this has to be changed. Taxation could be a good way to do that. How do you want to realize your plans for restoring biodiversity and cutting pollution by advertisements, laws or grants? And how do you want to draw the attention to the European citizens and make them realize that our environment is going to change drastically? And how can social media be a part of it? We wish you our best regards. What kind of prevention action is the European Union going to introduce to stop the destruction of biodiversity? In which way does restoring biodiversity help reduce pollution in urban areas? Thank you, bye! bye. Harming biodiversity has an effect directly on, uh, um, on our health. And uh, here there are two examples, uh, one uh, that we already hinted upon, uh, which is uh, uh, air quality. The European Environment Agency points that roughly 300,000 people, 300,000 people in the European Union die prematurely because of uh, poor air quality. And another aspect uh, that is uh, of uh, great relevance uh, today, and unfortunately in the last uh, two years, is uh, zoonotic diseases. Diseases that go from ecosystems uh, into um, 
into the into humans and the pandemic uh, we are living through is uh, is uh, one such uh, such disease so how does the eu uh, plan to to tackle the the biodiversity crisis crisis well the 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 compass for action is really the um, uh, eu biodiversity strategy of uh, may 2020 and uh, this biodiversity strategy has uh, two aspects to it uh, internally within the union and uh, the international dimension for the in, in internal dimension, there will be legislative and non-legislative measures, but the objectives uh, are to increase the protection of land uh, and sea to 30% uh, in, the, in the whole of the European Union, increase uh, the protection of uh, pollinators that are so crucial to biodiversity and the well-being uh, of, uh, of our Union, uh, reducing the use of pesticides by 50% by 2030 and uh, increase uh, the use uh, of uh, and the growing of bio products uh, in, uh, in our fields. Um, in internationally though, and I think this is the, the most uh, important aspect, the, because most of the biodiversity is actually to be found outside uh, the European Union, the European Union has two means to influence uh, external players. One is uh, through its internal consumption. So I mentioned that I'm uh, going to follow this uh, deforestation uh, proposal. And this is a very good example of how we can influence uh, deforestation abroad because the EU is responsible for roughly 10% of global deforestation. How? By using products uh, such as uh, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, meat, um, that contribute uh, to deforestation in third countries, such as uh, Brazil or Argentina uh, or, or in Asia. So if we say that uh, we are going to put uh, on the EU market uh, products uh, that uh, are certified, uh, that have been controlled uh, through due diligence systems that do not uh, contribute to deforestation, through our internal consumption and our internal regulation, we can have a huge impact uh, on external players. And then the second uh, aspect uh, is, of course, uh, through international diplomacy. And uh, next year, there will be a very important conference uh, in Kunming, China. It's called the COP15 the, on the Convention on, of Biological Diversity. And um, these, uh, uh, the, the objective of this conference uh, is uh, to create a post-2020 global biodiversity framework which aims to be a sort of a Paris Agreement uh, of Biodiversity. If you are interested, on Monday in the ENVI Committee, we are going to discuss uh, exactly this point. So if, uh, if, uh, if you are not tired of, uh, of listening to the European Parliament, on Monday, connect to listen to the exchange uh, in, the, in the ENVI Committee. Uh, go vegan. How much importance does this way of life uh, have for uh, climate emissions, for example. Is it very important? I must say I'm not uh, vegan myself, uh, but um, I do try to, to reduce my, my intake uh, of meat, especially uh, red meat, because we know by now that uh, the, the intake of, uh, of, uh, of red meat and our consumption of red meat does uh, put uh, um, a burden on, uh, on nature on forests, especially in, uh, in third countries. So, of course, uh, on one side, uh, we need to, to regulate. We need to ensure that in our trade agreements uh, with third countries, we have uh, very strong and solid uh, environmental clauses that uh, ensure that, for example, in our agreement with Brazil and Argentina, the Mercosur trade agreements, uh, uh, our agreement is not going to lead uh, to additional uh, deforestation and actually on the contrary should contribute uh, to uh, protecting uh, the forest. But um, the consumption of meat needs to be, uh, needs to be looked at uh, uh, carefully and, it, uh, and we know by now that uh, the consumption of meat, excessive consumption of meat uh, can, can put a burden on, on uh, ecosystems. So we will have a look at the top four ideas at the moment and let's use the official words used by the president of the parliament normally sitting in this chair. The vote is open. And we see that you are already participating a lot. Yes, I think the vote is closed now and we have a winner. 
We have a winner. I see the idea we didn't discuss yet. It's start taxing companies that don't recycle products and establish a state-controlled recycling program that pay for recycled products such as clothes, plastic, etc. I very much appreciate your dedication as it, part as it represents a sign of change in this direction. Clearly, you carry this dedication in your daily activities and would like to see it in EU-level policies as well. In fact, you are very eager to exchange views on the EU's initiatives to address global environment challenges. Like, you asked what the EU does to promote sustainability in different fields, such as clothing industry, transportation and car manufacturing. You engaged in discussions on the EU's plan to protect biodiversity and reduce water and urban centres pollution. And wondered how the EU will ensure the Member States abide by the Paris, Paris Agreement to tackle global warming. It might be of interest for you to discover that the European Parliament has been playing an active and very very active role in increasing the EU's ambition under the European Green Deal package. For example, thanks to the European Parliament's input and the collaboration with the Commission and the Council, the European climate law contains the EU-wide objective to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 and achieve climate neutrality by 2050. I believe this example examples uh, uh, and uh, exemplifies the pledges uh, you would like the EU to make more uh, for the future. Dear friends, to conclude, my sincerest thank uh, you, thank you once again for joining today's Euro Euroscola session. Hopefully, you enjoyed, learned from uh, one another, and most importantly, have been encouraged to keep your engagement with the EU high and your voice loud. When thinking on the, of the future at this very moment and words hope and bright come to my mind. Your engagement and commitment truly represent hope for a bright future of the European Union. So thank you very much for your participation and all ideas you have discussed. Thank you very much.